Chapter One of Bob's A Girl Detective. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bob's A Girl Detective by Grace May North. Four Girls Face a Problem. Now that the crash is over and the last echo has ceased to reverberate through the ancestral halls, the problem before the house is what shall the family of the Vanderdiffs do next. Gloria, I do wish you wouldn't stand there grinning like a Cheshire cat. There certainly is nothing amusing about the whirlwind of a catastrophe that we have just been through and are still in, for that matter. Gwendolyn tapped her bronze-slippered toe impatiently as she sat in a luxuriously upholstered chair in what, until this past week, had been the library in the Long Island home of the proud family of Vandergriffs. Gloria, the oldest of four girls, ceased to smile, but the pleasant expression, which was habitual to the blue eyes, did not entirely vanish as she inquired. What would you have me to do, Gwen? Fret and fume, as you are doing? That is no way to readjust your life to new and changed conditions. Face the facts squarely, say I, and then try to find some way to surmount your difficulties. Now, first of all, we ought... The dark, handsome Gwendolyn, whose natural selfishness was plainly portrayed in a drooping mouth and a petulant expression put her fingers in her ears, saying, If you are going to preach, I can assure you that I am not going to listen, so you might as well save your breath until... Hush! Here comes Lena May, in from the garden. Don't let her hear us scraping. It affects her sense of soul as discord affects a true musician. Lena May entered through the porch door, her arms filled with blossoming branches. Look, sister! Aren't these apple blossoms even sweeter than usual this year? The slip of a girl began, then paused and glanced from one face to the other. Gwen, what is wrong? she asked anxiously. But it was Gloria who replied, Nothing at all, pet. That is, nothing wronger than usual, if you will permit my lapse of grammar. But the dark-eyed sister threw down the book which she had been trying to read, as she exclaimed, You both know perfectly well that nothing could be in more of a muddle than our lives at the present moment, and your look for the silver lining philosophy, Gloria Vandergrift, doesn't help me in the least. The fawn-like eyes of the frail youngest sister turned inquiringly toward the oldest. Has anything more happened? I mean, anything new? she asked. Yes, dear. We had a letter from father's lawyer, and he states that beyond a doubt, our place here in Long Island does not belong to us, and, for that matter, it never did really. Grandfather bought it in good faith, I'm sure, but he did not receive a clear title. Then why doesn't our lawyer clear it up? That's what I'd like to know, Gwen said, throwing herself petulantly into another position. Why did father employ him if he cannot attend to our legal matters? But Gwen, dear, can't you understand? Gloria began to explain with infinite patience. When father died, leaving four orphan daughters, we knew that the fortune he had inherited had been lost through unwise investments. But we did think that the income from the vast acreage and the tenants would be sufficient to permit us to live in about the same comfortable way that we always have, but now we find that even this place is not ours, and that we are, well, up against it, as Bob's would say. Where is Bob's? This from Lena May, who was arranging the sprays of apple blossoms in a large pale green bowl on a low wicker stand. Look out yonder window, and you will see the object of your inquiry. Gloria laughed as she pointed toward the park, like grounds where a hoydenish young girl of seventeen could be seen riding astride a slender, high-spirited black horse with a white star in his forehead. 
"'I do wish Roberta wouldn't wear that outlandish costume,' Gwendolen began. "'And what's more, I can't see why she wants to be galloping around the country in that fashion "'when a calamity like this is staring us in the face.' "'The horse had disappeared beyond the shrubbery. "'The sisters supposed that the young rider would go down to the stables, "'and so they were somewhat startled a second later.' by seeing bobs vault over the sill of an open window and land in their midst gwendolen of course rebuked her roberta vandergrift aren't you ever going to become ladylike she admonished the newcomer was about to retort that she hoped not if gwen was a sample but gloria intervened don't be ladylike bobs she said now more than ever we need a man in the family but come, let's talk peaceably together and decide what we are going to do. All right, Roberta tossed her hat to one side and sat tailor-wise on the floor, adding, Fire ahead, I'm present. Such language was what Gwendolen refrained from saying, but Bobs chuckled in wicked glee. She thought it jolly fun to shock Miss Prunes and Prisms, as she called the sister, but one year her senior. Gloria, whatever you suggest, I know will be best, little Lena May said, as she slipped a trusting hand into that of the oldest sister. Now tell us, what is your plan? The oldest girl was thoughtful for a moment, then said, Honestly, I don't know that I have made one very far ahead, but of course we must leave here. That is inevitable. And equally, of course, we must find some way of earning our daily bread. Bread, indeed, sniffed the disdainful Gwendolen. You know that I never eat such a plebeian thing as bread. Well, you may work to earn cake if you prefer, Bobs told her. Then, leaning forward, she added eagerly, I say, Gloria, it's going to be quite a great adventure, isn't it? I've always been so envious of people who actually earn their own way in the world. It shows there is something in them. Anyone can be a parasite. But the person who is worth while isn't contented to be one. Ever since Catherine Delaney went to little old New York town to take a course in nursing that she might do something big in the world, I've had an itch to do likewise. Getting up at noon and dawdling away the hours until midnight is very well for those who like it, but not for mine. I've been wishing that something would jar us out of the rut we're in, and I, for one, am glad it has come. Catherine Delaney is a disgrace to her own family. This, scornfully, from Gwen. A girl with a million in her own name could hire people to do all the nursing she wished done without going into dirty, slummy places herself, and actually waiting on immigrants, the very sight of whom would make me feel ill. I never even permit Hawkins to drive me through the poorer sections of the city, and, if I'm obliged to pass through the tenement district, I close the windows that I need not breathe the polluted air. I also draw the curtains. I have no doubt that you do, Bob said, eyeing her sister almost coldly. I sometimes wonder where our mother got you anyway. You haven't one resemblance to that dear little woman who, when the squalid hamlet down by the sound was burned, opened her home and took them all in we were too small to remember it ourselves but i've heard father tell about it time and again and he would always end the story by saying my dearest wish is that my four girls each grow up to be such an angel woman as their mother was nor was that all lena may put in a tender light glowing in her soft brown eyes Mother herself superintended the rebuilding of the hamlet, which has now grown to be the model town along the sound. Then, looking lovingly at the oldest sister, she continued, I am glad, Gloria, that you are so like our mother, but you haven't as yet told me your plans, and I am sure that you must at least have the beginning of one. Well, as I said before, we must leave here and go to work. Gloria replied, I suppose the best thing would be for us to go to New York, where so many varieties of endeavor await us. 
Mr. Corey thinks that there will be about one hundred dollars a month for us to live on. That will be twenty-five dollars for each of us, and... Twenty-five dollars indeed! I can't even get a hat for that, and I certainly shall need one to wear to Phyllis Delaney's lawn party on the 18th of June if... But you won't be here then, Gwen, so you might as well not plan to attend, Gloria said seriously. We are obliged to vacate this place by the 1st of June. The Grabersteins, who claim their ancestors were the original owners, will move in on that day, bag and baggage. So my suggestion is that we leave here the week previous, and that we need not meet them. Have you thought what we will do to earn money? Lena May asked Gloria. Yes. Miss Lovejoy of East 77th Street Settlement has asked me to take charge of the children's clubs, and I have accepted. Gloria Vandergriff, you, a daughter of one of the very oldest families in this country, to work, actually work in those dreadful smelling slums. Gloria looked almost with pity at the speaker, who, of course, was Gwendolyn, as she said, Do you realize that being born an aristocrat is merely an accident? You might have been born in the slums, Gwen, and if you had been, wouldn't you be glad to have someone come to you and give you a chance? There being no reply, Gloria continued, I take no credit to myself because I happen to be born in luxury and not in poverty, but we'll have to postpone this conversation, for our neighbors are evidently coming to call. Bob sprang to her feet and leaped to the open window. Hello there, Phil and Dick. Come around this way, and I'll open the porch door. Gwendolyn shrugged her shoulders. Why doesn't Roberta allow Peter to admit our visitors, she began, but Gloria interrupted. One excellent reason, perhaps, is that all of our servants except for the cook left this morning. You, of course, were still asleep and did not know of the exodus. The sharp retort on the tongue of Gwendolyn was not uttered, for Phyllis Delaney and her big, good-looking brother, Richard, were entering the library. You poor dear girls! Just as soon as I heard the news, I came right over, Phyllis Delaney exclaimed as she sat down in a deep, comfortable chair and looked about at her friends with an expression of frank curiosity on her dull, pretty face. However, I told Maumere that I knew there wasn't a word of truth in this scandalous gossip, and so I came to hear it how it all started, that I may be able to contradict it. Phyllis took a breath and continued her chatter. Your maid, Gwen, told my Franchon, and she said that every servant in your employ had been dismissed with two weeks' advance pay and she said a good deal more than that, too, which, of course, isn't true. Just listen to this and tell me if it isn't simply scandalous. That maid declares that you girls are going to work, actually work, to earn your own living. I say it's true, Roberta put in, grinning with a wicked grin. Her good pal Dick smiled over at her and remarked with evident amusement. You don't look very miserable about it, Bobs. In fact, quite the contrary. You appear pleased. If the truth were known, I envy you. Honestly, I do. I'd much rather go to work than go to college. I'm no good at Latin or Greek. If languages are dead, bury them, I say. I'm not a student by nature, so what's the use of pretending? But the patter won't hear to it. Just because our grandfather left us each a million, we've got to dwaddle away our lives spending it. Of course, I'm nineteen now, but you wait until I'm twenty-one years old and see what will happen. His sister, Phyllis, lifted her eyebrows ever so slightly and looked her disapproval. In that time, you will have changed your mind, she remarked. Then turning to her own particular friend, she added, But, Gwen, you aren't going to work, are you? Pray, what could you do? Gwendolyn was in no pleasant frame of mind, as her sisters well knew, and her reply was most ungraciously given, curtly, 
she stated that she did not care to discuss her personal affairs with anyone. Phyllis flushed and rose at once, saying coldly, Indeed, since when have you become so secretive? You always tell me everything you do, so I had no reason to suppose that you would object to my friendly inquiry. But you need have no fear. I shall never again intrude upon your privacy. I will bid you all good afternoon and good-bye, for, of course, since you are going to New York to work, I suppose, as clerks in the shops, we will not likely meet again. Ah, I say, sis, cut it out. What's the big idea, anyway? A friend is a friend, isn't he? Whether he wears broadcloth or overalls. Then, as his sister continued to sweep out of the room, the lad crossed to the oldest sister, and held out his hand, saying, with sincere boyish sympathy, Gloria, I'm mighty sorry about this, er, this, well, whatever it is, and please let me know where you go, and as soon as you're all settled in, I'll run over and play the big brother act, if you'll let me. Then, turning to Bob's, he said, Go riding tomorrow with me at sunrise tomorrow morning, will you? like we used to do before I went away to school. There's a lot I want to say, and the day after, I'm going to be packed off to the academy again, to be tortured for another month. Then, thanks be, vacation will let me out of the prison for a while. Roberta hesitated, and Dick urged, Go on, Bobs, be a sport, say yes. All right, I'll be at Twin Oaks, where we've met ever since we were little shavers. When the door closed behind the departing guest, Gloria turned to the sister, who was but one year her junior, and said, Gwendolyn, I am sorry to say this, but the good of the larger number requires it. If you cannot face the changed conditions cheerfully with us, I shall have to ask you to make your plans, independent of us. We three have decided to be brave and courageous and try to find joy and happiness in whatever may present itself, just as our mother and father would wish us to do, and just as they would have done had similar circumstances overtaken them. Gwendolyn rose and walked toward the door, but turned to say, You need not concern yourselves about me in the least. I shall not go with you to New York. I shall visit my dear friend Eloise Rochester in Newport, as she has often begged me to do. An excellent plan, if... Gloria began, then paused. Gwendolyn turned and inquired haughtily, If what? If Eloise wants you when she hears that you have neither home nor wealth, if I am anything of a character reader, I should say that the invitation about which you have just told was merely a bait, so to speak, for a return invitation it is quite evident that Eloise has decided to marry Richard Delaney's million-dollar inheritance, and since Phyllis will not invite her to their home, you, as a next-door neighbor, can be used to the advantage. Indeed, well, luckily, Miss Vandergriff, you are not a character reader, as you will learn in the near future. You three make whatever plans you wish, but do not include me. So saying, Gwendolyn left the room, and a few moments later, the three sisters heard her moving about the apartment overhead, and they correctly assumed that she was packing, preparatory for her departure to Newport. Gloria sighed. <sighs> I wonder why Gwen is so unlike our mother and father, she said. I have it, Bobs cried, whirling about with eyes laughingly aglow. She's a changeling, a discontented nurse girl, wished to wreak vengeance upon mother for having discharged her or something like that, and so stole the child who was really our sister and left us with this. Don't bobsy, Lena May protested. Even if Gwen is selfish, maybe we are to blame. She was ill for so long after mother died that we couldn't bear the thought of having two deaths, so we rather spoiled her. I believe that if we meet her contrariness with love and are very patient, 
we might find the gold that must be in her nature, since she is our mother's child. You can do it if it's do able, Lena May, Bobs declared. Now, Gloria, break the glad news. When do we hit the trail for the big town? I'm going in tomorrow to find a place for us to live. If you girls wish, you may accompany me. Wish? Why, all the king's oxen and all the king's men couldn't keep me from going. Gloria smiled at her hoidenish sister, but refrained from commenting on her language. She was so thankful that there was only one Gwen in the family, that she could overlook lesser failings. Bob's was taking the mishap that had been fallen them as a great adventure, but even she did not dream of the truly exciting adventure that lay before them. End of chapter 1